This is Dave Pommel. Just stop. Just stop. Yeah. With NBM National Business Media. Greg Brown with all we do. This is Isabella Pinteric with Solid Stitch Embroidery. Mark Vassalanton with Vastex International. And you are listening to the Two Regular Guys Podcast. 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 Hosted by Terry Combs and Aaron Montgomery. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Oh, hey, well, welcome into the show. It's Friday, March 8th, 2019. I'm Terry Combs, and you can find me at EquipmentZone.com and TerryCombs.com. And I'm Aaron Montgomery, and you can find me over at AaronMontgomery.info. Uh, today, we're going to be going from hobby to profit as an embroiderer with Lisa Shaw. So we are excited to uh, talk to Lisa here a little bit later today, Terry, and uh, going to have a lot of fun. We uh, trying a little bit more with the video intro side. I think uh, we still got some work to do. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but, uh, yeah. that's, that's our uh, MO. <laughs> that's right. Hey, you always have to be trying something new, trying to be better and trying to get to uh, get to that next level. So uh, we, we were having we're that doing. conversation before we went on the air uh, when you were mentioning uh, making some change and, and my response was, sure, we've got minutes. Let's go ahead and yeah, yeah, give that let's a just, try. Just do it. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's do that right now. All right. We got people checking in, checking in already. So uh, Christine Shreve joining us. Thanks, Christine, for joining us this morning. And Paige and uh, Rich. And all right. So we're, we're, we're excited. We're live. We're going to make this happen. And uh, um, I, I said, you know, talking about taking it to the next level, um, I think that's a good transition, Terry, for my news item today. I, yeah, perfect. Perfect transition. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, all right. So a uh, news item that came across my desk here this morning was uh, next level apparel, uh, excuse me, apparel returns to SXSW, which is South by Southwest, as an official T-shirt sponsor. So uh, the story goes, next level apparel announced it will be returning to South by Southwest as the official T-shirt sponsor for the fourth year in a row. Additionally, the LA-based apparel company and marketing agency Collide partners up with South by South. Excuse me, South by Southwest. It's a tongue twister for some reason for me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> South by Southwest Music and T-shirt Showcase uh, this year. Next level and Collide will be doing a pop-up an event hosted at the Clive Bar for two days of live acts, surprise guests, and personalized festival teased from Next Level. So, Terry, you actually have a uh, connection here with this. I, I, I do. In fact, uh, Aaron, uh, you found out about 10 minutes ago that myself and Jay <laughs> Bissell from Equipment Zone, uh, we're actually going to be in the booth with uh, with our friends at Next Level because they wanted, uh, since it, the, the beginning of South By is, uh, is a technology uh, forum, uh, we're going to actually be doing some direct to garment printing right there in their uh, their booth. So uh, I'm going to be there on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and give me a chance to. Uh, if for anybody doesn't know, South by is uh, South by Southwest is in Austin, and both my sons live in Austin, and I get to go see meet my my new granddaughter who was born last month, and uh, <laughs> just uh, I, I already had a scheduled trip for two weeks from now, but the opportunity came up from the, our friends at Next Level, and uh, so. I'm gonna be uh, be hanging out with my sons and my new granddaughter and uh, and their significant others and and uh, have a have a big weekend in Austin. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, speaking of uh, Texas, we got all sorts of people checking in. I've been popping them up, but uh, Cindy's checking in. Good morning from Texas. So there, there it we is. Go. Cindy, <laughs> thanks for joining us this morning, and I uh, got the good folks from uh, Jersey Active Wear jumping in today as well. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be an exciting event. Um, Terry, uh, you know what we need to do though, uh, because we are talking about an area today that, uh, I mean, let's be honest, we know very little about. <laughs> I mean, can we can we say that? <laughs> I have um, embroidery on my shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. but I didn't put it there. <laughs> we know how to wear embroidery. We can do that. No, I, we've been blessed with uh, some fantastic guests, and and so we probably know more about embroidery than than we think. But uh, right, you know, for us, we we need to bring in the experts and and. Uh, Lisa is definitely the expert. We've got our guy, Eric, who uh, 
is also our go-to embroidery person with Christine and uh, Andrea Bomarito and lots of fantastic people. But uh, Eric uh, has agreed to join us today, not just as the producer and the back end guy like he normally helps us out with, but uh, he is going to uh, actually help us conduct this interview. So we speak intelligently as the two regular guys today. So why don't we, uh, I have to click on the button here while I'm talking, but uh, there we go. Uh, Eric is coming, I believe. There we go. Eric, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Always a good day to be on Two Really Guys. <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. Well, we've got uh, Todd uh, taking a break from moving. Yeah, he's moving up there in the Chicago area. I'm going to head to his shop once he's all moved in, probably around the Dax Chicago uh, show, and uh, go take some live video and stuff from there. So, uh, and Very then cool. uh, our, our friend Jeff Brown says, Congratulations on seeing your new granddaughter in a, f a few weeks early, Terry. So, uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> All right. Well, um, a reminder, uh, five things. We're still we're still holding out that you guys are going to want to participate in five things here. So um, no five things. <laughs> sorry, shiny object. Christine says three regular guys. <laughs> Eric, you've made it, dude. <laughs> no, uh, no, like, as I always say, it's usually two regular guys and one very irregular guy. <laughs> I, I'm very aware uh, of this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I think you're that, being fairly that. generous to Aaron and myself. Then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're boss, irregular, uh, that puts up. <laughs> yeah, if you're irregular, that puts us way off the map. <laughs> um, all right. So five things, guys. Uh, back to that real quick. Um, we're still waiting for you guys. Uh, we've decided that we really want this to be something that's the listener provided, listener involved, uh, be a part of it. And all you have to do is go to the very easy form on our website, uh, which is two regular guys.com. That's the number two regular guys.com slash the number five, <laughs> five <laughs> things. So two regular guys.com slash five <laughs> things, fill out the form. You will get, uh, get posted and we'll talk about you, you, you know, get all sorts of fame and fortune and, and <laughs> all that great stuff. <laughs> fame, it, it's, fame, it's really mostly. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's a really great opportunity that people should take care of, uh, take advantage of that. But uh, Hey, we would do also want to thank our regular listeners and any new listeners tuning in today. If you have an idea for a future show, go to our contact us page at two, the number two regular guys.com or reach out to us on social media. We are everywhere at two regular guys. And if you're catching the live video via Facebook Live, please jump in and participate. We'd love to have your, your questions and comments. So uh, with that, let's hear a word from our new gold sponsor. This episode of The Two Regular Guys is brought to you by Brighton Leap, makers of the Reggie Award-winning Embrilliance Embroidery Software. Embroiderers, you should know Embrilliance is different. You don't need dongles, licenses, or a trade uh, activation or activations to every user. With Embrilliance, one license runs every computer in your shop. Embrilliance runs natively on both Mac and Windows computers, and a single license lets you install for both Mac and Windows users. Their modular system lets you buy only what you need. If you need lettering, sizing, coloring, you can just do uh, you can just purchase that. If you want full blown top shelf uh, digitizing, you can get that as well. And every tool runs standalone or as a part of the unified platform. Embrilliance is flexible. You can even improve the way existing designs run while reducing the stitch count all from expanded stitch files. Check out their software for yourself at embrilliance.com. And just for our two regular guys listeners, you can enter the code 2RG, the number 2RG, at embrilliance.com slash store for 10% off your entire purchase. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, again to uh, Brighton Leap for their support. Uh, though they are our gold sponsor, we still have other sponsorship opportunities available. Check it all out at tworegularguys.com slash sponsorship. Excellent. Yes. Uh, thank you very much to Embrilliance. And, and uh, I think we may even touch a little bit on that today, a little deeper too. So um, yeah, we've got some comments. Uh, Mary says, best software around, super user-friendly. So uh right. The users are out there and uh, good stuff. Okay. Well, shall we? Shall we get to the, the meat here today, guys? Are we ready? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we don't want to just goof around forever. Not that there won't be goofing around during the interview. And uh, I'm sorry, Lisa, ahead of time for uh, 
<laughs> what we may do, but uh, yeah. let's go ahead and bring on Lisa. Today, we're happy to bring on Lisa Shaw, who's been an educator in home machine embroidery since the 90s, as the owner of Bubbles Menagerie, focusing on the software side of machine embroidery. Uh, from 15 years as the tech support manager for Buzz Tools to her work in, uh, representing in brilliance in social media and at trade shows, she has been supporting customers, creating online education, and teaching around the world. She's appeared on It's So Easy for PBS, written articles for creative machine embroidery and designs in machine embroidery magazines, and can be found teaching her own hands-on three-day events and at classes around the country. Lisa, welcome to the show. So happy to have you on. Hi, Eric, Aaron, and Terry. Good to be here. Kind of excited. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're definitely excited to have you on because honestly, uh, there's nobody better, I think, to talk about what we're talking about. I mean, we've brought on before these ideas of um, hobbyists and small shops and the rise of kind of the cottage industry, right? It's something we've talked about over and over where there are, especially in embroidery, the, uh, the parity of equipment allows there to be um, really professional work done in the home in a way that, I mean, people know there's been home shops forever, but it's more and more prevalent you can really do that kind of work. So uh, as you're teaching, and we know you're teaching all over the place, um, do you see a lot of home embroiderers moving into selling their work? And how do you find they usually get started when they're doing kind of their first hired work? Well, um, for ever since I started, people have been doing business, whether they want to accept it or not. As soon as you've done something for someone else, whether you get paid for it or not, you're working, you're doing for business. Um, so yes, I've been seeing it and it's a big transition going from that hobby and spending your time and energy and creative to actually making money doing this. So. so so like when they first start out, do you think, what do you think is like the first entry kind of space? Like what is it that brings them from, okay, this is a craft, this is a hobby, this is something I like to do to, okay, this might be something I can do, you know, going forward to pay. Like what's that entry look like? Well, usually it's someone approaching you and <laughs> saying, hey, can you do this? And it, that's usually what we call a love job. This is something we do because we love what we're doing. The hurdle comes when you understand that you've invested your time learning to do your craft, which is something that we all take for granted. But in addition to that, you have materials, you have thread, you have everything that goes into creating something and you need to get paid to do that creation. So someone says, oh, I need 15 neckerchiefs done for my Cub Scout pack. That, that was my first love job. And as <laughs> As soon as I did my first one, I'm like, oh, I'm done. Uh, what what am this became real work. I love what I do, but doing one is my idea of a good time. <laughs> doing 15, I'm like, I gotta rehoop again, I gotta do it again, I gotta watch the machine, change the threads. Because that's the big thing on a home machine, single needle. If you have a, you know, a six color design, okay, that's six thread changes. But when the customer says, Oh, I have this cute little flame, and it was a uh, campfire and it had the yeah. troop name and it was 12 colors on my <laughs> 350 stitches per minute machine oh my you know? for, for those of you who don't know in the commercial space it's very common right now to run at a thousand um and there are machines that are up to you know 1500 stitches a minute 350 is is just like watching paint dry and uh, not that i haven't done it on old machines myself <laughs> but for anybody who doesn't know i know because I, I can hear like uh aaron and terry their gears are grinding right now about how many stitches per minute are fast that's really really <laughs> slow <laughs> <laughs> and that's the maximum speed because when we look at our home machines it's that's if it's running consistently at that speed oh, yeah. oh it, it was horrible so at that moment i realized okay i gotta start calculating what this is really going to cost me because my time is valuable I and think we. Uh, that's I think the, we all. I think the biggest we... hurdle is because, as machine embroiderers and the home market, we love what we do, and we don't. When we're in our sewing room, yeah. we are having fun. But you have to. Um, that time, that fun, that compensation needs to take place in order to start making money doing this as a job. Yeah, I, I think we all have that. Uh, so. Have that job that we when we first started out and scratch our heads going, why did I say yes I to this? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. I mean, honestly, the thing that you, you touched on immediately, and I love to hear you say that. So this is Lisa Shaw, not Eric Campbell coming from the commercial side and invading your kind of craft space and telling you get paid. 
Lisa, who is who has been working with Home Ready Forever, says, "Hey, your time is valuable. Please, <laughs> please listen to us. Your time, it's valuable. Yeah. It's your life. The precious minutes of your life are ticking away in front of a machine. Maybe we want to get paid for those." <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And when you're doing that, when you're doing that calculations, we're trying to find ways to streamline, and that's where mm-hmm. a lot of this. You know how to increase your profit by spending less time doing the mundane things, and that comes a big into play when you're going from that transition and looking at what can I do? New hooping system, new machine. Do I get a second machine? Do I invest in multi needle? It's all those things that have to balance because the less oh, time yeah. you spend, the more money you're making in the long run. So, do you find that uh, most of those hurdles they that the initial kind of craft show maybe embroiderer or the person who's done a job that's just a passion project. Do you think those hurdles they first hit are more in production or are they more in the business side or is it kind of like just playing catch up on both sides to make this thing work? Um, It's really two. I mean, first of all, you have to have that business bookkeeping, keeping records, uh, buying materials, starting accounts, reaching out to suppliers, because you can't keep running to Walmart and Joann's. You can, but (laughs) that's again, time. You have to understand, I live 40 miles away from my nearest Joann's and Walmart. So uh, even if something's on sale, uh, I need to have a, a buy stock. So working with, looking for suppliers and finding someone that you can buy your stabilizers in bulk, get your threads in in large quantities so that you have everything on hand and only run out in an emergency, you know, in case that does happen. That's something, that's one of the hurdles. But keeping track and doing the business management side, invoicing, there is no, unfortunately, I've I've watched Eric's um read his articles and we've <laughs> chatted much about the, you know, what a dollar per thousand stitches or oh, something. Yeah. But that doesn't exist in a home machine. It just can't. So when you're starting out, you really have to kind of figure, I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it, but it has to sure. make money for you. So whether you got to have cut your costs and your time have to balance it, you're making money in the process. Yeah, and that's the thing that I think is shocking is I'll tell somebody they're like, oh well, I'm just working out of my third, you know, my third bedroom and something I do for fun. And I'm like, have you done a time study? And it's like, and I know I'm like, I'm taking production floor stuff and telling you to really uh, take a stopwatch and see how long it takes you to hoop something on your hooping system because honestly, by the time you're done with this thing, you you have to know what your production capacity is if you want to produce, and you have to know how much that stuff costs you in time and how much you need to make to kind of cover that stuff. Um, and I, I invariably, that's something that's a little alien, but it doesn't take, it's not like it's a tremendous amount of effort. It's just something that's a little alien when you're thinking of it as, you know, something fun that I do. Um, and in fact, the, the great thing, I've, I'm glad you said, oh, you, you know, you've read some of my articles and then we've talked about this pricing and how there's this, uh, this kind of crossover. Um, what I loved is when we were doing the show prep, um, you said some of your students actually t- tuned into an earlier show that we did talking about this stuff and how the difference and the connection between cottage industry and commercial industry works. And you said they actually kind of took something to heart out of that. I'd love to hear a little more about that story. Oh, it was, it was fabulous because they, they had tuned in. And what the whole comment was how larger companies, the embroidery businesses, those that have multi-needles and more than one multi-needles, multi-head machines, Mm -hmm. they need to kind of add the smaller jobs in and make it available because you're going to lose those customers. Well, a couple of my, um, we, I call them my tribe. When if you've ever (laughs) met me on my show, I talk about my tribe. So my tribe was tuned into the show and they said, you know, listen, um, I happened to reach out to one of them and Mm -hmm. I can do their small jobs. I have my single needle machine. I can actually do the samples for them. So if someone is saying, hey, I'm thinking about doing a corporate event. I only need 12 of these because it's just the top 12 or top 10 plus two are going or whatever. Sure. That They start working relationship with these larger companies, getting the small jobs, which not only adds to your resume, Because now your name is up there and you are like the go-to girl in your area. And I say girl because most of us are women in the home Mm -hmm. embroidery market. It's um, That is just nothing against the guys. (laughs) But we are mostly (laughs) women um, that get into this. And so you become the go-to girl. You are the, Mm the business that people come to. And it, that is one way to get your business started. And to, um, because first of all, you know, that this larger company understands how to 
charge for payment, how to get the artwork properly. They know the quality goods to have it stitched on and what the pricing is. So you're lo you don't have to make so many decisions on your own. It's a contract and it yeah. can help build your income coming in, doing the one-offs, doing the uh, smaller runs for them. And not only it's a symbiotic relationship, you know, and you to, can get I, from them. Oh, totally. I can't agree. I can't agree more. And here's what I'll say is somebody coming from larger shops. I mean, not not huge shops, but say running, you know, 40, 40 odd to 60 odd heads pretty reliably. Coming from that medium sized shop, um, we had a stable of smaller single head. And I'm usually I'm talking about a single head multi needle, but it really we had people who were embroidering in there, like we said, in your bedroom. We had a guy who literally he'd come off of his job every day and he had a, a single head in his in his front room where he would sit and eat dinner next to a single head running all the time with noise canceling headphones on. That was the way he did his thing. But when we needed one piece, especially toward the holidays, people, we need people to do one piece. Do you know how tired I am of stockings? Uh, if, you, if you folks wanted to do stockings for a big company, trust me, they do it. And then the other thing is, I think that it becomes a resource because some people say, okay, well, I, I want to do multi-needle or I want to find out about what this commercial business is like, but I don't know how. You start working with those people and they'll let you come into the shops and teach you because it is that symbiotic relationship. And, and actually on that kind of on that note, um, you know, many of the home embroiderers, I feel like when they're just starting, they don't understand where to go for these resources. Both of them are talking about literal resources like materials. I know you mentioned that a little bit and then educational resources to make them, you know, have them make that transition in the right way. What do you think is out there in the way of resources that you see that helps them really kind of start making money? And where do you think they should look coming from that home embroidery side? Well, first of all, Google is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> My first place I'm looking for anything um, is, is the Google search engine or whatever search sure. engine is your favorite. And be as generic, but as specific as possible. I do this a lot when I'm looking for how to digitize on leather. Now, I use the Embrilliant software. Sure. And in, when I do my Google search, I'm not going to type in how to digitize for leather using Stitch Artist because I've just chopped off every other embroidery software out there. Mm. So whenever I'm doing a, a search, I try to be specific. Leather is specific. Digitizing sure. is general. But um, <laughs> get the um, make it wide enough so that you can find what you need. When you do that... That's when you start bookmarking. I mean, Eric, your blog is probably one of my number one referred to people. In fact, it's just like, it's one of my shortcuts on my phone. It's easy to see. It's, put your blog post up there. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 might, I might want to post more often. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you should. That, there's I there's your motivation. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> but yeah. But once they start searching on you, they'll find your blog, they find your printware, they find all the resources, which again are places that you can go finding where uh, more information about these things. Uh, trade shows are a fabulous way to get information, especially if you're just starting out. I meet so many people that have like the PE 770, which is a brother single needle five by seven who are real popular um, on the internet or is sold online. And a lot of those people, they started out, they would sell their stuff on Etsy. And now they're looking to get a multi-needle. Well, you can't really buy a multi-needle online. You, you can, but you, there's there is such you a could, learning curve shouldn't. going from a single needle <laughs> machine to a multi-needle. And the, yeah. there's two things. I just have to mention this because it's this is probably the number one question I get. I'm coming from a single needle going to a multi-needle. What do I need to take into consideration? First of all, multi-needles don't show you the pretty colors in your design. Even, the, even if the display <laughs> is- They're just starting. They're just starting <laughs> to do it. And you're right. Most, Especially you go by and use multi-needle folks, you are on your own. The file type doesn't generally put everything in for you. <laughs> no, you have to colorize it. The DST format, it's just color breaks. And yeah. you know, my first when I went to my first trade show, which was a commercial show, I, didn't, I couldn't understand, well, how do you know what thread to put in. We didn't really have soft. I didn't have software yet at that time when I went to my first show, so I didn't understand what was there. Um, but that's a huge, huge thing. Your bunny looks like a, you know, a psychotic zombie. It's just has weird, <laughs> no colors, so you have to know what color to put in. The second yeah. thing is that there is no hoop. 
you know, there's no restriction. You can load any size design you want in any hoop, but um, <laughs> you can yeah, tailor I'm, your frame. I'm trying not to laugh because the thing is, uh, I found this out the first time I worked on a, a home crossover machine. Um, the funny thing is, everybody goes, "Oh, well, the tech, the commercial machines have more technology in them," and they do to some degree, depending on what it is, but not in certain areas. And the big thing is hoop size. Um, little crossover home machines, the, the multi needles that look very much like our machines know what hoop is inserted and you can back up into the back corner of a hoop and you will never hit that hoop with the presser foot. You will never, uh, I don't know, say drill a needle into a hoop and break the reciprocator on the machine so it stops working immediately. Uh, but you surely can on a commercial machine if you try. Uh, so that's <laughs> admittedly the first time I ever went into the home space, I had to say, wow, you guys have automation we don't have. Maybe your machines might be a little slower, but funny enough, there's some stuff that would be good for say, if you were bringing in a second person in production um, who wasn't particularly all that skilled, uh, they actually have a better chance running a crossover machine because they can't damage it the way you can on a commercial machine. Commercial machine just <laughs> assumes you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 you just have to get into routine, of course, as usual. But, and that's the other thing is that, um, you know, when you are coming from a flatbed single needle machine, things mm. are harder to hoop. So, mm. it, it, because you can't, you don't have that yeah. free arm to put your bag over. It, you have to do everything flat and things have to get turned inside and out. So it's a little bit different way of thinking. So mm -hmm. that, again, that's the time, that's the money. And once you get used to it, it's really hard to flip back and forth between the two of them. Mm -hmm. But it is, um, would I, if I was doing production, I'd have to have a multi-needle machine. I just, I couldn't do it on a single needle. And when people are saying, well, I'm just gonna invest in another single needle, I'm thinking, well, yes, you can have two running at the same time, but if you just did the one single needle, you probably get three times the amount of stuff done just because of hooping techniques. And that was the other thing that the um, working side by side or as a with the um, someone that's already established and you're doing their small jobs, you can learn about different items that you might not normally hear about. For example, mm -hmm. uh, the clamp hoops or the fast frames yeah. or jerky hoops. You may not see those, but those are like standard operating procedure in most uh, commercial because they have to get done fast. So that can also, that's just one more thing you get to learn. Yeah, equipment and efficiencies, certainly. And actually, we have a question in here that I'd like to bring in um, from Marlena Mack. Uh, what is the best way to market your service to the mid size <laughs> and large size contract embroidery companies? I don't know if you have some input on that, and I'll certainly jump in too. Well, you probably have more on that <laughs> because my my idea of marketing yourself is is basically um, I'm always marketing myself. You see, I'm wearing embroidery today. I love yeah. to talk about what I do. Uh, so that's, I, I think I've brought more people into the fold as far as doing machine embroidery, but as far as marketing my service to large contract companies, that's, let me see what you have to say on that, Eric. <laughs> well, honestly, you're, you're part of it's correct. Uh, the, if you're always wearing something, especially if you're going to go out to do this stuff, wear your logo, which I know it sounds goofy. I'm going to tell you all this really low tech stuff, but seriously, wear your logo out, talk about what you do to people, and then honestly show up. Believe it or not, even if you have somebody who might say, okay, for a moment, they look a little nonplussed when you show up in their showroom and say, hey, I'm a small embroidery company. Every once in a while, you'll find you'll find a company, larger company looks at you and kind of like, I don't know what to do with that. You're like, we do embroidery here. We don't need you. There may be somebody who says that, but every once in a while, you're just going to have to keep putting yourself out there. There'll be somebody who says, you know, give me your card. Later on, it might make sense. The other thing is, make sure you give them a story, a pitch for what you're going to be useful for. Take the thing I just said, hey, when the holidays come up and you have five stockings that you don't want to handle, I'm pretty used to in the home embroidery market having to flip stuff inside out and do all this weird work to get something hooped. Give me that stocking and I'll handle it. And I think that's if you give them that kind of idea where you go, when you have overflow, this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to steal your customers. I don't want your big job. I don't want a job beyond what, I, what I'm capable of doing or what's going to make sense for me. But when it comes down to November and you're starting to sweat because you have all these little one piece, two piece, three piece jobs, send those over here. I'm excellent at handling those with you know detail and quality and I can show you my work if that's what you wanna see. I mean, you have to sell them the idea. They're not going to understand out of the gate. What they're going to hear, some of them, especially if they're new in the business or they have that kind of what I always call the job starvation where they feel like any job has to come in the door. No matter what it is, I have to run it. It doesn't make sense to, it doesn't matter if it if it makes sense, if it's profitable or not, every job is my job in case that I need it later. Um, 
there are companies, especially long companies who've been in the business for a while who do not have that starvation feeling anymore. And they look at a job that has, like I said, especially a couple of stockings, something strange that they don't usually run, uh, an embroiderable uh, stuffy, which is like the little, uh, you'll see stuffed animals that are made for embroidery. I know that as a commercial person, I could do them. I even know that the margins are pretty good. But the idea of me handing it off to a production person who's never seen one and having it done fills me with dread because I know that they're going to freak out. <laughs> if I could hand that off to somebody who knows how to do these things or gift items or bridal stuff, maybe stuff that, you know, a commercial embroiderer is not the bread and butter. I would love to hand that off to somebody who's done that stuff. And I know that in the home market, you guys use more materials than we use. You do more crazy experimentation than we do. And you actually, by and large, when I talk to home embroiderers, they know fabric better than a commercial operator. They know how it's going to operate a little bit better because they've been in there experimenting because it's also what they're doing on the weekend. And they're not they're not kicking off for beers at – well, they might be kicking off for beers at five. But, <laughs> but afterwards, they're talking about embroidery. So no, I, I sell, sell yourself that way, folks. Go in and give people an actual use case for how you're going to work out. And um, honestly, I think that's that's a good thing to think about that you're going to be a resource for them but they can be a resource for you. And if you pitch yourself in that symbiotic space, that's fantastic. Plus, if you want to get into the commercial industry, I'm going to be honest with you and say that if you decide one day, you're like, I desperately do want to be commercial. I want to be an operator. Starting from there and showing somebody, hey, I'm somebody who knows embroidery. That's somebody where I want to hire you as an operator later if you want to get in. And it might be a way that you end up learning commercial embroidery as you can get in as an operator on a part-time shift and you'll be very helpful to the company, but also get yourself the chops on the equipment that you might not have. So there's there's my long-winded answers. To some, All right, take, <laughs> take, take a breath, Eric. Take a breath. Take a breath. Take a breath, <laughs> take a breath and not, not pitch anymore for myself. But uh, I yeah. want to get back because, Lisa, we have plenty of stuff more to talk about. I mean, you talked about equipment. Um, people really sometimes see the split between home and the cottage industry is how they're equipped, but I there's a lot of crossover. Um, do you see people using what we would call commercial equipment uh, in your teaching? And when do you suggest that like the single needle people move into what we might call a commercial machine as they start working for business? Well, there there is uh, quite a bit of crossover uh, starting. Um, you know, most of it I see probably the biggest difference the biggest time that you should switch over to a multi-needle and look at how to change your way of doing things is when the jobs you're working on are too hard for what your machine can do. Now, if you're doing something like embroidering on an art canvas or something that's really unusual or those and only one at a time, then maybe it's not a big deal. But if you're doing a lot of ball caps and you're trying to flatten that ball cap and stick it to stabilizer. It, it's a lot of work. I thought that setup of lining it up and getting the needle in the right position, that, that just takes so much time. And same thing with um, tote bags. You're turning them all inside out, especially the heavier duty ones. Or if you want to do, um, I have a friend that just started doing the um, folding chairs and she's doing it on a single She's holding that folding chair up in the air as she's doing it. I'm like, wow. That's a <laughs> that, I've that's seen this. <laughs> the, bun the bungee cord system of hooping, yeah, where it's hanging from hooks in the roof so you don't wreck your machine. Yeah, no. <laughs> I've exactly. Seen somebody do that I, before. At that point, yes, you probably need to. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if even commercial machines would hold a, you know, a chair up. I mean, that's a one-off. They're obviously taking it apart. But mm. if that's where you're headed, if you're doing a lot of the same things over and over and over again, you're finding your setup time is, and so you buy another set of hoops. So while one is embroidering, you're hooping another one. If you start investing in more things with your single flat ned, flatbed mm. machine, Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time to start looking at getting the multi needle simply because the hooping system on a multi needle is, is phenomenal. The next thing is thread colors, even a six needle. You set six thread colors, you can set one to black all the time, so you can change five. <laughs> I mean, that's just a huge time saver. Uh, and then, of course, setting it up in your software so that it just takes advantage of that so that you're not um, changing your thread colors as often. You know, the funny thing was when I started with my single needle machine. I'm just doing my designs. I got, I kind of nicknamed myself well, the one color design girl because it was <laughs> such a pain in the butt to change your um, your thread all the time. So I loved one color design. <laughs> so now I have a six needle. So I can do six colors. <laughs> so the six color girl. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now, the most I've ever done on my multi needle is 172 colors. 
that is not for production. That that's that is a no. love <laughs> art piece. And the gentleman <laughs> that um, saw it, I have a trade show. It's the Embroidery Library Haunted House, 172 mm. thread changes. He offered me twenty five dollars for it. <laughs> a whole twenty five dollars? You're kidding me? <laughs> yeah, he was gonna take it off my hands. I'm like, oh, I don't think. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's add- where educating your customer comes into to, to play, and um, yeah, doing things as a specialty item and things like that. But um, uh, you know, learning about the items for that go along with a multinational machine. Mm-hmm. Doing your research online is great. Trade shows are fabulous, and um, I bro- I. There's two in the um, home market that are what we call hybrid shows. One is I just finished in South Carolina called the Everything Embroidery Market, and they're going to have one in Kentucky. They'll have both multi-needle and single needle for the home machine. They have the silhouette uh, cutting machine and the scan and cut because we're having in the home market, we're getting a lot of people coming over that um do the vinyl cutting and heat transfer and they're getting an embroidery machine to add to their business. Now that's yeah. another where the place that you can pick up uh, jobs is mm-hmm. if you have the experience in the embroidery and you're approaching someone that does the screen printing or the vinyl cutting, mm-hmm. they can either learn everything that you know, or you can kind of, you know, <laughs> do My it name is Lisa, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> <laughs> nice, you know, and nice. show, bring in the complimentary work and say, Hey, you, you can offer this and work out a symbiotic relationship that way. Mm-hmm. But trade shows are a, a fabulous way to go. Another one, I said, everything in Brady market and the applique getaway, which takes place in Dallas in June. Again, mm-hmm. you'll have the multi meal as well as the home machines that are there. So it's, you get to meet your tribe. You get to see what they're doing and talk to people, network, find out what they're doing. That's where you got to talk about what you're doing. And if you can get to the trade shows, uh, those are the ones in the home market. Of course, you have the ones that you're always talking about here on the podcast, which are commercial. And they can be a little bit intimidating for someone that only has a single needle machine. My first commercial show was not the most um, positive (laughs) <laughs> um, because I was, I was, I was snubbed because 25 years ago, this is how long we're going. I yeah. was told I didn't have a real embroidery machine because it was a single needle. <laughs> no, <laughs> and I didn't have real software. So yeah. it was there right now it, it's become easier to get into and you're not, you know, looked upon. Uh, so I, what I'm definitely <laughs> going to say, I'm going to jump in briefly just to say um, from the educator standpoint at the commercial shows like DAX or ISS, we're doing ISS Atlantic City shortly. Um, I have people come in crossover all the time who are working from home businesses now um, and also on the floor of ISS. And I mean, I, I love the commercial brands. That's where I go for my machines if I want one. But on the floor at ISS, they had brother machines in some of the booths. They had crossover entrepreneur machines in some of the booths. So it, the idea of that not a real machine, not a real embroiderer is not as prevalent. And you can meet people who are helping people with business. And I know uh, with Aaron here, who is always big on business and planning, I kind of like to bring in the idea that you know sometimes you go and what you're doing here isn't just equipment. You're meeting people to do business. You're doing uh, financing and stuff like that. And I know... Um, I actually kind of want, I would love Aaron to comment on that a little bit. Um, <laughs> talking about business, and I know we've had some comments for, coming in from uh, from some of the commenters on the Facebook Live. Um, what do you think about that? What do you think about business, Aaron? Bring that in a little bit since we're talking about. <laughs> that yeah, now. yeah, definitely. No, good, good stuff. Um, and really, yeah, I just wanted to share some of these comments that uh, mm. that we have. Uh, this is probably going to take up the whole screen here, but uh, Dave Harding, <laughs> uh, who's with uh, DCA Leasing, uh, he said. I said earlier, said even if it's for fun, make sure you establish your business by getting a bank account and setting up with a federal tax ID number or a business license. Uh, and so, if you're, you know, at some point down the road looking to do some financing, uh, the money gets cheaper the longer your business has been established. So, to verify time and business, companies like DCA Leasing use things like the federal tax ID number, business license. Um, mm-hmm. So, it may take a little bit more work on the front end, but you know, just think think big picture, think down the road about, you know, yeah, single needle and and maybe I'm able to kind of make some investments, but you, you are going to, you know, (laughs) that's the fun part of our industry, regardless of what side you're on is you get to play with the toys. 
Uh, but to be able to play with those toys, <laughs> you got to have some money. <laughs> so if you need to borrow some money, um, yeah, having your business set up as early as possible is is a great way to go. So, um, that, yeah, and, and I basically agree with that. You know, that, that planning up front, thinking long term, regardless of, you know, it's a it's a love job. Like Lisa said, I love that. That's fantastic. You also have to, you know, make a living at, at some point too. And, and if you love it that much, why not make a living doing something that you love? So um, uh, I think that's uh, great. Um, so if I can just jump in for one further second here, I just wanted to share a couple more comments that I thought were fantastic. Um, mainly just fun here. Christine Shreve said, your bunny looks like a psychotic zombie. <laughs> Single best <laughs> sentence in a podcast ever. Uh, I do not disagree with that. Um, <laughs> all right. Lisa uh, for the win. <laughs> uh, and then change, changing gears completely here, but Cindy Knight uh, King, uh, I probably said that wrong, but anyhow, uh, I will say when you live away from big cities, you run into problems of machine tune-ups. So yeah. something to think about. Um, definitely just wanted to get that comment up there. And then I finally have a question for you here, Lisa, that um, uh -oh. I can get to here if I got to find it in the comments, but it, the question was from Paige and uh, she asked when setting up your business, should it be set up as an LLC? Is that something that you could answer for us, Lisa? Or you, uh, uh, that's not my area of expertise. I, okay. I, it all, it's all a do your accounting, your attorney, your accountant needs to set that up. I yeah. Mean. Yeah. Totally. Hey, hey Aaron, and, and I'll jump up in. Let me jump yeah, in real quick, it, and, and uh, I wanted to follow up on what uh, Dave Harding had said. Uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of folks who uh, who do equipment leasing, and the very first question somebody like Dave uh, is going to ask is, "How long have you been in business?" And and you, when you say, "Well, I've been doing this from home for five years," well, th now you have to prove that, and and having the business license or the federal ID number, the, your state tax number, and 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 um, basically all those things are are free or very inexpensive to do. But um, you know, if you've been doing it for that long, you should have uh, all this documentation so that you can be viewed as a as an active business rather than startup. And I I've had so many customers who who uh, have gotten leases, but they've had to get a lease as a startup because they never went through the steps of setting up the business. And and uh, a lease for a startup is going to be way more expensive than it is for somebody that has some history. So I just wanted to add that to uh, Dave's comment. Yeah. Well, and that kind of licensing also, and I, I think we probably have people who can speak to this. Uh, it helps when you're talking about trying to get, as Lisa said, uh, materials in a commercial stock when you're trying to sure. get thread, when you're trying to get stabilizers uh when you if you have a business license if you have some proof of operation it's a lot easier a tax id even better uh to get things at wholesale prices because i know that's the other thing a lot of people struggle with in the home business and lisa i'm sure you could tell me more about this is us uh, sourcing garments um especially when they start doing apparel regularly they end up having to source from weird online sources or like you say buying at walmart in droves and trying driving around trying to find pieces um, that is a hard thing people have to get over. That's a big, big hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. Developing a relationship with, um, your sources, whether it's blanks or raw materials is, is huge, huge. And it's just something you need to take, you need to plan for. And otherwise it, it's too chaotic. You, you need to have, first of all, you need the quality. And if you're just buying one offs or, you know, bulk, yeah, it may run out. Closeouts are great. You can offer, you know, things on deals. <laughs> but um, what happens when they come in next month and they want the same shirt and you've got it on clearance somewhere? So it's like, uh, you know, you go from a, a reasonable thing. But yes, having the business license and getting your set up, yourself set up as a as more than just Lisa Shaw, you know, with a home machine, you know, you have to have a, you having the documentation behind it. Um, is a great entry point. Uh, otherwise, the companies aren't going to want to talk to you because they just think you're buying, you want something cheap and you want yeah. one, one or two, you know. So, well, even the, these days, minimums have dropped. I mean, really, minimums have dropped all over the place. It's not, the minimums are not what they used to be. Um, it's, right. it's a rare company that has a dollar minimum or a order minimum that they absolutely won't do. Now, you'll be, you won't be at the top end pricing where you're getting the best wholesale pricing possible, 
but you, the, the minimums aren't as high as they used to be by any means. And that's also for outsourcing. Though I, I will say we did see Christine jump here in here earlier. Christine Shee from Enmart. She's like, I might know somebody who can help you out with thread and supplies. I'm like, always <laughs> nice. be promoting yourself, people. Christine is, is, is giving that's you exactly a good right. on that one. Always yeah. promote. Good job, Christine. <laughs> good job, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, um, speaking of Christine and, and some other sure. things, so going back to the uh, LLC thing, yeah, I, I I wanted to throw that out there, but I would agree that uh, LLC is is definitely uh, the way to go. It's just a way to protect yourself, and and mm -hmm. and it's really not that difficult, honestly. Um, it, it it's you know I, I actually just set up one for a separate business that I'm starting, and and you know it took a little bit of digging sometimes the state websites aren't the best but um <laughs> they, they've got all that stuff there so uh sharon said uh that uh accountant said yes i'll see is what they told me but then uh going back to christine she also commented um about her business and mart that um having a state tax id or business tax okay. id can help with a lot of suppliers are so to access their wholesale pricing is based on having a tax id number so okay. and again not not difficult to do not going to cost you a lot of money you know getting your federal tax id number uh is is super easy too so um don't be scared of that stuff i guess is is kind of the comment that i would make so well i found uh, a lot of businesses are willing to take you under their wing on that if there's somebody who's into small business oh there's nida <laughs> Our Nida, our friend Nida Klein, Lisa, your studio looks amazing. So, well, <laughs> so thank you. this here. little area looks great. <laughs> <laughs> you you, yeah, you don't, don't look behind the, the camera curtain. for us. <laughs> 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 well, we, we talked a little about about equipment and stuff like that. I had, while we're while we're on the equipment and supply stuff, I know that you're really into software, and I'm super into software, obviously. So. While we're here, while we're here, let's talk a little bit about embroiderers and digitizing software. Um, first thing, there are tons of embroiderers you don't digitize. As an in-house digitizer for many many years, even I had to get over myself and say, uh, "Yeah, okay, not everybody digitizes, Eric. It's just you, dude, <laughs> who wants to digitize everything himself." Um, but some people swear by having like the local control of it, so they like to digitize themselves, like I do. Or there's people who really like need customization. Um, what role do you see customization and like digitizing software having in profit? And what do you think about like outsourcing as it comes to uh, digitizing? Well, you need to know what your strong suit is. If if you, computers just uh, you go like this when you think of it working on the computer, <laughs> then digitizing you don't need to learn it. You don't. That's not. You're going to spend more time at the computer than in in production. So you have to balance what it is that. Um, is where's where's your money coming from? Cu uh, customizing software. So there's two types of software. Customizing, mm -hmm. which is working with existing designs that someone else has already digitized, mm -hmm. adding lettering, you know, changing things up, mirror imaging, merging designs. That's easy. That's fun. That's click click and you're done. <laughs> digitizing. That's the whole other ball of wax, and you have to have a lot of skills and invest the time to learn how to, to do it. Now, software has greatly improved over the years. I remember my first design I digitized took me 15 hours. It's a little four by four <laughs> pumpkin, four colors, 61 <laughs> jump stitches. Uh, you know, it, 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 I didn't know any better, than, and I was yep. very proud of that design. But I wasn't going to make any money mm. doing that digitizing just to get it done. So you need to, in addition to finding where your com customers are coming from, outsourcing. If digitizing is not your thing, outsource it. Find someone and develop a re working relationship with them because one of the biggest hurdles I find with outsourcing digitizing yeah. is that communication. First of all, giving someone a graphic and having them understand what it is that you want. We had a great picture, Erin, you commented on this morning. I belong to the Stitch Artist Digitizing Fans Group. And mm -hmm. someone posted a picture of a shark. And it was one color, red shark, and she wanted it done in 3D foam. Was it possible? And being able to look at that and say, well, OK, if you wanted it to be on 3D foam for a hat, yes, it would work. But what if you did the satin columns? And you need to have that. that uh, creative communications going on and be able to work with someone so that they're not afraid to give you these um, yeah. constructive criticisms and or not even criticism but just ideas yeah. that first of all it's going to knock up punch up your result to yeah. that next level it's not just a flat fill red shark <laughs> i'm going to do it sure. ooh, give it some texture and and it just puts your result 
a little bit higher. So working with someone that has that creativity, being able to communicate, um, it, that's fabulous. It also takes something off of your plate. I will be given, people bring up their dis business cards to me all the time. And it has this really ornate logo on it that's this big. <laughs> and um, they think that I can digitize from that. Well, <laughs> First of all, there's like 150 colors in this. <laughs> so you need to have this conversation. And do you want to have that conversation yourself or can't do you, you need to have mm -hmm. someone comfortable with that is going to work for you to have that conversation so you can be doing other things while they're doing the digitizing, while they're creating, doing their skill. Yeah. Um, and that's I, that's probably the biggest thing. I have to be like, preach. Because <laughs> <And so, laughs> I'm a digitizer. I like to digitize. It's what I want to do. The idea of pushing around little bitty stitches for hours at night until something works doesn't make me balk. I have been around people who watch me work and go, what in the world are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, that's fun for me. I enjoy doing that. I want to experiment with texture and design and play with it and run things out. And I want to do tiny measurements. And yes, I've put a caliper and a magnifier up to a piece of embroidery within this week. So yeah, <laughs> that, that's real stuff. So that's something digitized want to do. What I want to say though, is that if you do want to digitize, because the other thing we end up happening, there's two sides of this. Either people say you have to digitize absolutely and they freak everybody out by saying, nope, digitize is the way to go because you don't want to pay for it because that's an extra expense, which is the worst reason to digitize ever. Expense yeah. is the worst reason because it's actually not that expensive these days, whether I would like that or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the other half of this thing is saying, okay, no, you can never digitize, always outsource it. It's a total waste of time. Why would you ever buy that? If you want to create, if you want in-house control, there's reasons to do it. But the great thing is it's a, it's a spectrum. You don't have to stop right now and say, I'm never going to buy digitizing from someone again. I'm going to do it all myself. Hire things out while you're learning. And honestly, if you have a good relationship with a digitizer, they're usually excited to talk about their craft a little bit, or at the very least, if they're just a good digitizer functionally, they're just good at what they do, take that design into your software, measure everything, watch that design run out, take notes, measure how thick their satin stitches are, how big the overlaps are, check out the stitch angles, how long their stitches are, and honestly, steal every little bit of their settings that you can figure out and reproduce it for yourself. I, I learned in a vacuum pretty much. I was in a production shop by myself as an operator learning from existing designs. Yeah. And I learned in months by myself doing that and was at full production. It, now, admittedly, I was crazy and young and spent hours every night tearing things apart and <laughs> running things. That's not everybody's <laughs> jam and it's not what everybody wants to do. But the idea is if you can get to a level that you can run a production shop in a few months doing that, then someone with some guidance who does, does some classes, who's hiring out some of their stuff can absolutely get there. So, I mean, you can digitize if you want to. So don't, I'm not saying dissuading people, but outsourcing is <laughs> not a dirty word. And it can be a spectrum where you keep outsourcing stuff until you feel comfortable. Exactly. So both of these things are possible. But so what, what I want to reiterate is, do you think then people can be to totally profitable just running customizing software? Do you feel that's fairly safe to say? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and most and most of my customers or my tribe that do that, that is exactly what they do. Um, it's just easier. It's the one offs yeah. and it's customizing is the way to go because you don't have to, you can do all, do that in house. And it is pretty much once you know what designs you're working with, it is what you see is what you get. So See, that's I just have to have somebody else say that but me because now I feel I feel bad because I'm the person who says I like to get digitized software. And honestly, if you're someone who thinks you're ever going to do it, think about it. I think it's a good investment to have in your shop just so you can do little things that you want to do for yourself. You can learn that stuff. But it took me a long time to get to the point where I understood that you could be an embroiderer and never digitize a thing and always hire stuff out but have say, like you said, customizing software, lettering software, you can combine some designs and run those out and and be not only profitable, but successful and creative. And I think the home market helped me learn that stuff. So um, we've got some good uh, comments here. I'm gonna bring up really quick. It looks like everybody's saying time is valuable. Digitizing is time. That's that we had that one. Then we have Cindy here again saying uh, for our small shop, it's worth it to have the digitizing done. It's perfect and ready to go. If you have a good digitizer, uh, they are gold. And if you have a relationship with them where they'll talk to you and actually examine some things, uh, very great. And Nida brings up this last point that I think is perfect. Um, it's good to know how digitizing works, how embroidery works at a level that you know what to ask for. I have people come to my digitizing classes all the time who say, oh, well, I don't digitize. And I say, hang around. 
<laughs> because I'm going to show you how this thing works. And when something doesn't work, you can go back to Digitizer and say, the pull compensation is not good here. Right. And you know why, and you know what it's doing. And if the Digitizer hears that and they know, they'll you'll be able to get your result faster. It'll be one edit, not three. So learning digitizing fundamentals or going to Lisa's class and having her walk you through one-to-one -one how to do stuff. I mean, maybe you're thinking, I'm not going to digitize all my pieces. You will learn to digitize some stuff. And if you're still hiring things out, you can say, no, I know. You know, <laughs> I saw I saw how you draw shapes. I know how to compensate. I know what overlaps are. I know what compensation is. It's always, it's always better to be an educated buyer. So <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, because otherwise, you know, predatory salesmen can take advantage of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, running, but running it's joke. It's true. <laughs> running joke. <laughs> Terry is not Lisa, predatory at all. He teaches everybody. Yeah. Lisa, just so you know, our, our inside joke is that we've always referenced Terry as a predatory salesman, and you need to watch oh, out for the predatory salesman. <laughs> he's, like the, he's like the least predatory salesman he's teaching all the time. So <laughs> I, I, I actually horrible. walked into the back of a classroom one time, and, uh, and the speaker was uh was talking about predatory salesmen and he goes like terry <laughs> so that's where it came from <laughs> so every every time we can't help but say that, that, that was greg kitson by the way so uh, thank <laughs> you greg, for having that uh stay with me for the last 10 years <laughs> great great friend of the show super nice guy who apparently can still zing terry <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so uh, um we went through we went through equipment we've gone through resources we've talked about software but if you had, Lisa, I have to ask you to boil this down. We're getting toward, we're almost into bonus time here. If you have one thing, one lesson for the people you teach, for, for out of all of this stuff we've talked about today that you'd like to see people take away from this, from transitioning from that fun job, that love job into profiting, what was your one kernel you want to give them? Oh, wow. Yeah, boil it down <laughs> to just a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> trust trust me. Um, probably <laughs> do your research. Uh, figure out what it is that you want to do. Where do you want to focus and make a, write it down. Um, I digitize by a plan. I, you start a business by a plan. The only way that you know if you're making any headway with whatever it is that you're doing is if you have a checklist that you can go through and say, oh, I did everything on this. Now what's next? So probably make a plan and see what it is that go from there. You well, know. you're you're now Aaron's favorite guest ever because uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> planning. That's where it's all at. Absolutely. <laughs> how, how many times? I, I think if we cut do it together a supercut of Aaron saying the word plan, we could probably do a whole show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I have it to is. agree with you on that. People sometimes think like, okay, it's always the art, it's always the creative part, and that's great. And if you want to keep doing that, a great way to fund that is by doing the business part and the planning correctly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, no, I love to hear that because here's Lisa, who you're always sharing these really awesome things on social media where it's creative stuff and it's experimental. And to hear that you've got a plan going there, I feel vindicated when I tell everybody to measure everything and write everything down. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I followed my plan all the time. I, I, I'm awful. I, you know, do what I. How is it? Do as I teach, not as I do. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least the fact that you're actually planning, though, is just that to me, that's, you know, the working on the business part and the, the fun part is working in the business, but you've got to work on the business, too. And that's that's always what planning has been to me. So, yeah, I, I'm the same way as you, Lisa. I, I have a great plan. Well, following that plan never really happens. But you know what? Then I sit down and go, OK, well, let's figure out <laughs> where we got off track and, and regroup and come back. So that that's that's great that you're you're explaining that to to your tribe. I love, love the tribe thing too. So Lisa, anything else that uh, you want to kind of share with our listeners before we let you get out of here? We've stole plenty of your time here today. Well, I had a blast doing this. I just wanted to let everybody know that you can always find me. I have my own website. I'm not sure if it's listed anywhere, but it's so-bubbles.com. And you can find where I'm teaching, what events I'm going to be at. I have a blog that's searchable for information. And like I said, most of my stuff is my focus is software. It always has been. That's where my roots are. But um, I'm just, as you can see, I embroider just as much as the, the next person. I am a hobbyist. I do this because I love doing what I do. And my dad always told me, whatever you do in life, um, just if as long as you're, you love what you do, you're never working. 
you're always yeah. enjoying yeah. what you're doing because we spend way too much time at our job. So love what you do. <laughs> Outstanding. All right, Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, checking you out uh, in, down down the road. And and yeah, get get over to so-bubbles.com and, and uh, get in touch with Lisa and follow all of her fantastic stuff on social media too. You, uh, you We feel like we're uh, living right along with you there. So appreciate that. <laughs> Great, Absolutely. thank you. Awesome. All right, take care. Awesome, guys. Well, that was a, a ton of fun and... Uh, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Terry, did you write all that down? <laughs> did you get all the notes? I, um, I, I push, started pull, uh, some other things. Yeah, I, I, I've got <laughs> pages here, but <laughs> <laughs> all right, good, good, good. I'm I'm gonna, I just the tribe is growing. <laughs> I need, a, uh, I need a, a, a name for my followers. Aaron, what yeah, do you want to so, be called? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, well, not the normal things that you call me, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so Debbie shared, as a member of the tribe, we love our Lisa. So very yeah, nice. You know, have, have that kind of a, a group. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, guys, uh, let's see here. Some other events here coming up real quick before we get out of here. Um, mm -hmm. I've got uh, my Facebook Live that uh, I've been doing on Saturday mornings called Small Business Saturdays, and that's over at Aaron Montgomery. Uh, actually, sorry, facebook.com slash Aaron Montgomery dot info. You can check that out there tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, customer centric me metrics versus uh, company centric metrics and uh, why it's important to focus your company metrics more on the customer side of things. So uh, it should be uh, a lot of fun, something that I, I like to talk about in my daily world. Um, and then April 5th, uh, the DAX Minnesota show is happening and uh, I will be teaching two seminars there, developing a business plan. And then uh, the second seminar I'll be teaching there is being customer centric equals more profits. So uh, I'm excited about uh, Minnesota coming up. Uh, what about you, Eric? I know you've got uh, some things coming up before Minnesota, actually. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will be out at ISS Atlantic City. So uh, Thursday, March 21st, you're going to catch me doing the scientific stitcher, which is measurement and testing. And that's the kind of stuff we talked about. A lot of crossover people there who want to learn more about how to measure and test and get faster at making your embroidery work for you and uh, get through those digitizing problems we talked about. Uh, there's also uh, March 23rd, Saturday at ISS Atlantic City. You'll see me doing uh, embroidery pricing models explained. And that's one of these things where I like to talk a lot of theory instead of just giving you a sheet to fill out. Uh, this is going to tell you the kind of models people use to price for embroidery, how they work and why, not just uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So jump in and find out that you won't get an Excel spreadsheet. You'll get an idea about what these pricing models are and why they work. <laughs> Uh, after that, we're going to be doing uh, DAX Minnesota, and I know we're all out at DAX at Treasure Island. So Friday, April 5th, you'll find me doing the large show that I do, the, the really long kind of three and a half hour grouping, uh, digitizing difference, <laughs> uh, 3D foam gradients and performance wear. We're doing deep dives into each one of those things. Everybody wants me to teach these. So this year we're doing those as like a triple seminar. And then the last one, uh, Saturday, April 6th, DAX Minnesota again, patch making for fun and profit. Every other thing I teach, and I know I say this every time, every time I teach anything else at the table after I teach, I'm always teaching how to make patches. It happens every time. So this time, finally, you can come and see a whole seminar just about patch making, and we can teach it twice, I guess, if you can want to come up to the table afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Terry? Uh, well, I'm going to be, myself and Jay Bissell, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be joining Brett Bowden with Printed Threads in the Next Level Apparel booth uh, down at South by Southwest. We'll be there. Uh, I'll be there through Monday, so come by and say hello. Uh, my upcoming complete screen printing business courses. I'm going to be in Nashville with Atlas Screen Supply on March 16th and 17th. That one's sold out. Uh, Phoenix, uh, I'll be with Workhorse Products on April 27th and 28th. And back in Chicago with Atlas Green Supply on June 22nd and 23rd. I've got a couple of uh, Epson DTG full day classes coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me, March 20th, I'll be in Atlantic City at the ISS show. And then March 27th, I'm going to be in Irving, Texas at the MBM show. And um, also at the uh, ISS show in uh, Atlantic City, I'm going to be doing a DTG uh, seminar uh, on March 22nd at 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, two seminars at the DAX show on Friday, April 5th. They'll be competing with Aaron. It's not a popularity contest, uh, <laughs> but, <it is. laughs> but we do count. <laughs> and you can find all my uh, upcoming 2019 events at terrycombs.com under the, uh, the heading tour dates. 
Excellent. All right. Well, Terry, get a drink of water from that two regular guys <laughs> tumbler you have there. So, uh, <laughs> excellent. Um, okay. So before one, one quick thing, before we close out, we're, we are in a bonus time, but uh, Christine had a fantastic suggestion. And I think we're going to have to run with this. The, the two regular guys fans should be called the regulators. Uh, so I love, love that in, in so many different ways as a, uh, as a Gen on fire the, today. <laughs> yeah, outstanding. As, as, as a Gen X or product of the eighties, uh, the song, uh, regulators, uh, is a favorite of mine. So I can, I can hear it now. Regulators mount up. <laughs> there we go. So good go. stuff there. Um, and it's, she suggested it. we do a uh, dinner or something at Dax. Um, so maybe do that. I, I really want, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it off for Minnesota, especially because of the location in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But uh, my goal is to pull off a uh, kind of a two regular guys meetup after the party on Friday night in Chicago, the Chicago yeah. land Dax shows. Um, so Terry, you have to actually stay for that. You mean I can't <laughs> just whip in there and, uh, and spend eight hours on the ground and then hit the head of the airport. No, I've, I'm already right. scheduled you, to be there through Saturday, Aaron. So we're good to go. Nice. Nice, nice. So, so Melanie, uh, that answers your question. Hopefully, yes, we will all be we'll there. All Christine be. will be there. Um, yeah. So it, uh, those DAX shows are, are well worth the uh, time and investment and uh, mm -hmm. kind of gives you a nice flair actually between, you know, that, that commercial level, you, know, you get to see some of that stuff, but uh, I really feel like the exhibitors and people there um, are all, you know, I'm about small businesses. We're all about that kind of level so nobody's going to talk down to you i don't think and and if they do we'll uh we'll get the regulators together and take care of it so. <laughs> i can tell you like that one that's that might stick i, I <laughs> think so too it, it i'm loving stick. it <laughs> uh, all I'm right like, I, well, I wonder if somebody could make some gear or something that says yeah. regulators on it. Who, who could we find who could do something who like could that make a hat yeah, yeah. that said regulators <laughs> on the front <laughs> an embroidered hat or something uh, i wonder how that oh, here word. we go. <laughs> nice. Uh, oh, yeah. Todd says uh, B Dubs is close to the convention center at Tenley Park, so I, I will uh, get get on that <laughs> and see if we can get uh, get some space somewhere and have like a little meetup, a little uh, kind of go back to the roots, Terry, Just sitting around yeah, the bar chatting about up. work. Wings, wings yeah, and bear, yeah. people. Wings and bear. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, guys, we're well into bonus time. Let's uh, let's get on out of here. We've come to the close of another show. Uh, seventh year in, and we appreciate every one of you guys spending some time with us each Friday morning. And uh, we want to especially thanks, thank, excuse me, especially thank Lisa Shaw and uh, her time that she gave to us today. I know her time is valuable, so we appreciate it. Check her out at so bubbles.com. I'm going to put it, I think I'm going to put it back up on the video screen here, real go. quick, too. Yep, there we go. So you've got it there, and uh, you can find her blog, travel schedule, upcoming events social media all of it right there at her website so uh please follow her if you're not already and uh, all right and thank you very hey, much, we also want to <laughs> thank you lisa and uh, we want to thank eric uh campbell for putting this show together for us today you can find eric at ericcampbell.com there's an h in the middle there because his mom <laughs> wanted him to be a little different <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> boy, boy, she, she succeeded didn't she <laughs> <laughs> e rich campbell she wanted you to it. be a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> we also want to thank our sponsor in brilliance and their entire family of products. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, next week we will be uh, welcoming back uh, Tiffany uh, Spitzer. And uh, she was on with uh, Christine last week. And uh, so she's going to join us and uh, we're going to go from embroidery over to screen printing and uh, get her take on some screen printing questions that, uh, that we've got uh, I don't know. The pressing questions, I guess, would be the, the way to put it, Terry. And uh, there you go. so that, that's going to be a lot of fun. So tune in next week for that event. Absolutely. Until then, I'm Terry Combs. He's Eric, uh, Eric Campbell and he is Aaron Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> and we are the two regular guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out. our website at two regular guys.com that's the number two regular guys.com 
You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash two regular guys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash two regular guys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, two regular guys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.